Orbital Gardens, this is Mission Control. We are confirming acquisition of your signal. You are live in 5, 4, 3, 2... Hello and welcome to episode 17 of Gardeners of the Galaxy, the podcast for all of the sentient beings in the universe who have a passion for plants. I am Emma the Space Gardener and I will be your host as we explore gardening on Earth and beyond. I'm happy to announce that the living situation has improved here at Orbital Gardens. Ryan has installed a new oven and a gas engineer has fitted our replacement boiler so we have heat and hot water again. We're still in lockdown of course but then you can't have everything. I'm recording this episode on Chinese New Year as we enter the Year of the Ox. The ox symbolises hard work, positivity and a fertile harvest so it sounds as though 2021 may be a good year for space gardeners. Mars has also just celebrated its new year, a year on Mars' 687 days on Earth. Year 36 started on the 7th of February 2021, and the next Martian New Year won't be until the 26th of December 2022. The United Arab Emirates Hope Probe successfully reached Mars orbit on the 9th of February, followed by China's Chanwen-1 orbiter a day later. China's mission includes a rover, but that won't be deployed to the planet's surface until May. In the meantime, NASA's Perseverance rover is due to arrive on Mars on the 18th of February. The next Northrop Grumman supply vehicle is scheduled to launch to the International Space Station on the 20th of February. The NG-15 capsule is named after Katherine Johnson, the black mathematician whose calculations were a vital part of NASA's early spaceflights. There will be various new science experiments on board, but the most interesting to space gardeners will be Magnitude Io's Leguminauts, which we learned about in episode 12. And the Leguminauts have just found out that they'll be coming back to Earth on Crew Dragon in early May. If you're a European who dreams of going into space, then you're in luck. ESA has announced that for the first time in 11 years, they are recruiting a new class of astronaut candidates. There will be a virtual press briefing on the 16th of February, and applications will be open on the 31st of March. ESA is seeking to expand the gender diversity in the astronaut corps and is strongly encouraging women to apply. Not only that, but David Parker, ESA Director of Human Robotic Exploration, says that diversity at ESA should not only address the origin, age, background or gender of our astronauts, but also perhaps physical disabilities. He is therefore launching the Parastronaut Feasibility Project to make that dream a reality. Back in January, NASA astronaut Shannon Walker worked with the Bionutrients experiment, which demonstrates a technology to produce nutrients for humans on demand during long-duration space missions. Bionutrients is a five-year experiment which launched the ISS in 2019 and will run until 2023. The aim is to use engineered microbes, like yeast, to generate nutrients to supplement potential vitamin losses from food stored for very long periods. Scientists at NASA's Ames Research Center developed the experiment using the following strategy. Take a safe organism already present in our food, in this case, baker's yeast, modify it so that it produces an essential nutrient, and build the right hardware to let astronauts grow in space. Like tiny living factories, the microorganisms will go about making the desired product, in this case, beta-carotene and zeaxanthin, antioxidants usually found in vegetables and critical for keeping our eyes healthy. It's not a very high maintenance experiment and astronauts periodically activate four specially designed packets. That involves removing the inner growth packet from the outer storage bag, adding 50 milliliters of sterile water, mixing the contents and placing the bags in a temperature controlled incubator at 30 degrees Celsius for 48 hours. The samples are then frozen down to minus 80 until they can be returned to Earth for examination. At the moment, the bionutrient experiment does not produce food for human consumption. The idea is that in the future, the contents of the package can be cooked to kill the microorganisms while maintaining nutrient quality for consumption by the crew. Sounds yummy. This experiment exists because it may not be possible to provide complete nutrition from stored foods during a multi-year mission. Many nutrients have a limited shelf life, which means nutritional supplements will be of limited value. And the fresh form of vitamins tends to work better than a tablet anyway. The bionutrient system will test two different types of yeast. One makes spores as part of its life cycle and should stay stable in that form for five years. That's a reasonable shelf life for use during missions to the Moon or Mars. The other type does not make spores and so may have a shorter shelf life. However, it's already in use in commercial probiotic supplements and there are many more yeast species of this type so they will have more potential future applications. 
When the samples arrive back on Earth, scientists will be checking how much yeast grew in the packets and how much nutrient the experiment produced. They'll also investigate how long it stays good on the shelf and can produce fresh nutrients, and which genetic features allow it to survive long term. The technology will also have applications on Earth, growing nutrients and medicines in remote places. And if you're interested in the topic of space food and how we'll feed crews during a mission to Mars, then come and join me for a chat in my new Facebook group called A Martian Kitchen. Recent topics include space sushi, Chinese space food, and a recipe developed by high school students and served on the International Space Station. On a similar topic, Discover Magazine has an article about a NASA research project called the Center for the Utilization of Biological Engineering in Space, or CUBES. The aim for CUBES is that it will support biomanufacturing for deep space exploration, advance the practicality of an integrated, multifunction, multi-organism biomanufacturing system on a Mars mission, and showcase a continuous and semi-autonomous biomanufacturing of fuel, materials, pharmaceuticals and food in Mars-like conditions. One of the things CUBES is looking into is how to treat sick astronauts in space. Shipping medicines with them will take up valuable cargo space and be expensive. Many medicines require cold storage, and they all have a limited shelf life. Unlike the moon, Mars is too far away to ship emergency medications or bring a casualty home for treatment. A potential solution is to use programmable plants and microbes to produce medicines for us. This could use a seed stock model, where seeds from a plant that has been genetically modified to produce a drug are launched with the astronauts. Once they get to Mars, the astronauts can grow the plants and either eat them or extract and purify the medicinal component, as we do on Earth. The team are currently using a genetic modification technique called agrobacterium transformation, which uses the bacterium to transfer DNA into the plant's genome. An alternative would be to synthesise genes that code for the drug and inject them directly into the plant. That's done using a gene gun, a ballistic device that shoots DNA onto a leaf with enough force to penetrate the plant's cell wall. At the moment, Cubes is looking into growing lettuce plants that produce a drug to treat bone loss, and they're going through a reasonably standard breeding process, propagating multiple generations to create a stable variety. They're also investigating the potential of spinach, and they've chosen those two crops because they've been used in multiple NASA experiments. They also have a very high harvest index, which means most of the plant can be eaten, and that makes them good candidate crops for Mars. On the 8th of February, the ISS crew started a new experiment in veggie. This is still Veg 03 and involves growing extra dwarf pak choy, Amara mustard and red romaine lettuce using seed films. The astronauts also completed a survey to evaluate their moods and assess any psychological benefits from interacting with plants in a spaceflight environment. And they set up the plant water management experiment, which investigates using passive measures for controlling fluid delivery and uptake in plant growth systems. Watering plants in microgravity is a challenge, and the PWM experiment examines using other physical properties such as surface tension and capillary action to replace the role of gravity. There are six planned demonstrations for PWM, and I'm not sure which one is currently running. In late 2019, the research team stated that PWM 1 and 2 were already on board the ISS, and PWM 3 and 4 were expected to launch by late 2020. All four are shown as assigned to Expedition 64, which is the current ISS crew. PWM1 involves a hydroponics demonstration of root motion and fluid uptake in a wedge-shaped channel with no soil involved. PWM2 involves a soil container and fluid reservoir used to demonstrate the evaporation rates at different times in a plant's life cycle. In both cases, the experiments use a simulated plant made from rayon felt and nylon string to provide passive water uptake and evaporation roles. PWM3 and 4 demonstrate using capillary forces to control plant watering in low gravity. From what I can tell, this is the first time a PWM experiment has been run, so hopefully more details will emerge over the coming weeks. ESA has announced that the Melissa Space Research Programme is partnering with Kinetic and Capacité to demonstrate cultivating and harvesting spirulina algae in zero-gravity conditions. Spirulina can recycle space station waste by feeding on carbon and nitrogen, producing food with high nutritional potential. ESA's long-term ambition is to create an autonomous space station. MELISSA is an acronym for Microecological Life Support System Alternative. The project, which began 28 years ago, is internationally recognised as the most advanced effort to develop artificial life support systems. And if everything goes to plan, we'll hear from Grace Kane, a scientist currently conducting research at MELISSA, in the next episode. <laughs> 
It's Black History Month in the US, and as I explained in the last episode, I have been investigating which of NASA's black astronauts have conducted plant experiments in space. The second name on NASA's alphabetical list is Guion Stewart Bluford Jr. Guy Bluford joined the astronaut class of 1978. He became the first African American in space when he launched on STS-8 in 1973. He flew on three more shuttle missions, STS-61A, STS-39 and STS-53. According to New Scientist, nearly every space shuttle flight through the 1980s and 90s carried experimental plant payloads. However, as far as I can determine, three of Bluford's four flights did not. Indeed, the primary experiments on STS-39 and STS-53 were conducted for the Department of Defence, and so are classified. It seems unlikely they involve plants. However, STS-61A was different. Space Shuttle Challenger launched on the 30th of October 1985 with ESA's Space Lab, a laboratory module designed to be carried in the shuttle's payload bay. The Space Lab D-1 mission was the first with German mission management and was controlled from the German Space Operations Centre. STS-61A holds the record for the largest crew to be on board a shuttle for the entire mission. There were eight people on board. They split into two teams, each working a 12-hour shift to ensure 24-hour operations. Luford joined NASA's Jim Buckley and ESA's Ernst Messerschmitt on the red team. According to NASA's mission press kit, four plant experiments were on board, all investigating how plants respond to gravity. They were called gravity perception, geotropism, differentiation of plant cells and statocyte polarity and geotropic response. Space Lab's biorack included a centrifuge to recreate the gravitational force that plants would feel on Earth, 1G, thereby allowing scientists to distinguish between the effects of microgravity and other spaceflight conditions. In August 1999, NASA published a report on the microgravity experiments conducted in Space Lab. It mentions two of the plant experiments. One showed no significant difference in the length of lentil roots grown in microgravity or 1G. While the roots grown in 1G grew downwards, the roots grown in microgravity grew any which way. If they were then placed into the centrifuge, they were capable of responding to simulated gravity. An experiment using cress roots confirmed that the germination rate for cress seeds was the same in microgravity and 1G. In microgravity, the roots grew at angles of up to 60 degrees, while on Earth they mostly grew straight downwards. Both experiments told us more about the effects of microgravity on statoliths, Statoliths are small, starch-filled packets that settle at the bottom of gravity-sensing cells. We know that plants can detect gravity using statoliths, but we also know it's not the only way they do so, and research is ongoing. In 2017, for example, the Plant Gravity Perception Experiment launched to the ISS. It used Arabidopsis mutants engineered to lack functional statoliths, so their response to gravity could be investigated. I can't find any images or video of Bluford with the plant experiment specifically. However, there are images of him participating in other space lab experiments, so I am happy to confer upon him the title of Space Gardener. That's it for this episode. You'll find the show notes on my website, theunconventionalgardener.com, which is also home to a virtual tip jar for those of you who would like to support the show. If you want to become a regular supporter, you can sign up via patreon.com forward slash gardeners of the galaxy to access extended episodes and bonus content. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Orbital Gardens. Gardeners of the Galaxy has its own Facebook page. And if you enjoy chatting about space plants, you can join the discussions on my Discord server, which is called the Space Greenhouse. Thanks for listening. Goodbye. Orbital Gardens, this is Mission Control. We're confirming termination of your signal. The Grand Control team would like you to rerun the radish cropping experiment. Apparently there was a bit of a mix-up with the samples you sent down and the technicians had them for lunch. They did say to tell you they were very tasty. Mission Control out.